Hello and welcome to another installment of Beards and Cars Rivals, the series where we pit two or more cars in a head-to-head -head showdown, but in less of an abstract sense, not so much about lap times or on-paper numbers, and more so about actual real-world ownership. Which car is the most likely to suit you. Now, the biggest disclaimer that I want to put out there right at the start of especially this particular episode is if you haven't had the chance to test drive these three cars in some variation, please do yourself the favor of doing that. In fact, I would go so far as to say, even if you're not actually going to buy one, just blag off whatever excuse you can to a car dealer to get the chance to drive one at least one of these three. You owe it to yourself to experience them because they are among my favourite cars I've ever driven. Now, with that in mind, you will recognise the three in question from Top Gear, of course, the Porsche Panamera, the Aston Martin Rapide, and the Maserati Quattroporte. Fantastic trio, one of the most iconic showdowns in the Top Gear series, and this is where I weigh in with my thoughts as well. And I'm actually going to focus in less on stuff like used prices and performance for a couple of reasons. One, you're probably not too concerned about used prices if you're even considering buying one of these. Plus, used prices will vary wildly, depending on where in the world you are. And secondly, because this to me is one of those occasions where it's more about the way the car makes you feel, rather than any one specific number deciding the whole thing. You know, like a Nürburgring lap record, for example. This is not that kind of scenario. So, my thoughts on these cars are actually that it's a much simpler showdown than you might think. See, each of these cars appeals to such a distinctly different kind of driver. Not to say that you can't enjoy all three, I love all three, but each one of them definitely has a specific personality and a specific vibe. To the point where I believe there are actually certain adjectives which suit each car. The adjectives erotic, gothic, mysterious, well, that's the Maserati Quattroporte. The adjectives impressive, accomplished, and dominating. Those are the Porsche Panamera. The adjectives elegant, classy, beautiful. Those are the Aston Martin Rapide. And if you're the kind of person who values a car which makes you feel good, something which is charismatic, something which feels lovely to drive through corners, something which handles itself like a sports car, something which can be a luxury, practical four-door car, but really feels like it's a, a vehicle designed for driver enjoyment at its core, then pretty much without question, the Quattroporte is the car for you. If, on the other hand, you're the kind of person who wants a car which dominates any scene it's in, from being parked to driving, something which is unequivocally a sheer status symbol with so much panache that's oozing with prestige that it is undeniably the ultimate four-door supercar, in my opinion, and even as a Maserati fan, I would say the single most beautiful four-door car of all time, then without question the Aston Martin Rapide is the car for you. If, on the other hand, you value dominating everything else on the road, being faster than 95% of the vehicles you'll ever come across, having a rich and varied motorsport history poured into its development, and a sheer amount of engineering which allows the car to not only demolish the other two in a straight line, but also all year round in all weather conditions and with surprisingly good levels of practicality from fuel economy to luggage space, then without question the Panamera is the car for you. To me, that really highlights just how distinct these three cars are, because everything I just said is exactly what I believe about them. It's not to say that you can't love them all, though. I really do, for all of the above reasons. But to me, each of them has a couple of distinct advantages and disadvantages over the other two, and this will probably have some similarity to things that Top Gear have said. Now, I'm actually going to talk about the black sheep first, the ugly duckling, the Panamera. To me, the Panamera is a car which has such an undeserved amount of short shrift from many people, because if the best thing you can think of to say bad about a car is that you don't like the look of it, to me that says a hell of a lot about what it's good at. Because if the appearance is the only bad thing about a Panamera, itself an entirely subjective opinion, 
Well, that really speaks volumes to how crushingly good everything else about it is. The Panamera, in my opinion, is almost like a Nissan GTR combined with something like a Mercedes AMG. It has that kind of raw, brutal side of the Mercedes with that kind of prestige, smoothness, comfort, luxury, and badge panache, but it also has overwhelmingly capable beautifully engineered performance, both through corners and in a straight line, like a Nissan GTR. Now, to me, the Panamera is, if you're looking for performance, without question, the best of the three. And the reason why I'm not going to get too far into individual specs beyond broad statements is because, simply put, there are so many variations of these cars to choose from. With the Maserati, in my case, I had a 4.2. You can also get a GTS with a lot more power. With the Aston Martin, you can get the base model. You can get the S model, which I drove. You can even get the AMR Pro, which is possibly the most exotic four-door ever built. And then with the Panamera, you can get everything from a 250 horsepower diesel to a 520 horsepower Turbo S, even in its first generation form, let alone second generation with hybrids and wagons, etc. So there's no real point in just sticking to one exact spec. What I will say, though, is I would recommend if you are going to drive a Panamera and try one out, you should probably try out either a GTS or a turbo, because those two really, in my opinion, display the two best things about the Panamera. The GTS is all about the driver enjoyment, and simply put, the, the GTS that I drove, a first generation red one, which you'll probably see in this video, is the biggest turnaround in my history of driving. I went from having no interest in the Panamera, specifically not liking them, to by the time I finished driving it, wanting one. And to this day, a couple of years removed, I still plan to buy one at some point. That speaks volumes and should tell you a hell of a lot about just how good of a car it is, how deeply impressive the Panamera is. The Aston Martin for me was a love story before I even sat in one. I was hoping so much that it was a car that would feel as good as I hoped it did, especially given how mixed of a bag my previous experience with Aston Martins had been. I've driven a Vanquish. I wasn't that impressed. I drove a Vantage. I wasn't that impressed. I drove a DB7 with the supercharged straight six, and I was very pleasantly surprised, but I felt like I was a pretzel after driving it for only a few hours. So I was worried <laughs> driving the Rapide. It's my favourite four-door car, by far my favourite Aston Martin, and I was really hoping I would love it. Well, I do. It's an absolutely stunning car, and due to the increase in price of one over a Panamera, I do hope to one day own one of those as well. It is a bucket list car for me. Lastly, the Quattroporte. For those who don't know, I may have even mentioned it earlier on in the video, I've had two of them. So in terms of actual ownership, this is the one I bring the most experience to the table with. Maseratis have a certain reputation. They have a reputation which, in my opinion, is deserved. They do have problems. And speaking as someone who's also owned a Bentley Flying Spur... I do have something of a track record for picking very, very dangerous vehicles to own in terms of reliability. It's very much like owning a Bentley. It's a time bomb of a car. Sure, you can get one that you can own for a decade and never have a single problem, but those are the exception not the rule. If you have a Maserati, you are going to adore it. Even if you weren't a Maserati fan, I think anyone who drives a Quattroporte will fall in love with it. A friend of mine, for example, who many of you know from the Discord on the channel, I let him drive my Quattroporte and he fell in love with it almost immediately. Quattroportes, or really any Maserati, just has a certain allure to it. I will say that the main problem, unfortunately, that the Quattroporte has, something which even its bedfellow, the Gran Turismo, doesn't have, is that because the Quattroporte doesn't hold its value for a number of reasons, it tends to be purchased by people who don't have the same budget as for the other two cars. And I will most definitely include myself in that. I bought a Quattroporte as my second car. Of course I didn't have the budget to run a Maserati as it should be. With that in mind, a lot of people will buy them and then just sell them on when it has an issue, or just not take as good a care as it deserves to have. So for a Quattroporte, sure, you can get one a lot cheaper, but I would recommend going for the lowest mileage you can possibly afford, and for the best Condition, of course, you can afford, and definitely look for having the least amount of owners in terms of ownership, and that goes for anything from a base model to a GTS. 
And of course, in particular, I'm basically talking about everything up to this point of Quattroporte, not the latest stuff, where it's not really a proper Maserati anymore, in my opinion. Now, in terms of downsides, each of the three definitely has them. I've kind of just touched on the downsides for the Maserati. The downsides for the Aston Martin are that the luggage space is kind of awful. Not in terms of just space itself, but in terms of the design of the trunk. It's almost like a step system in the boot, where you, you just can't fit anything but a, a number of small bags or boxes or fitted luggage without immediately running into problems. Sure, you can put the back seats down and have a very nice amount of space, like a Panamerican, but then it kind of negates the point of having a four-seater. To the point of being a four-seater, the space problems, ironically, for such a big car, are actually carried over to the interior as well. It's a four-seater, but it is snug, I will say that. There's not too little space, you know, even I myself enjoy driving it, but it definitely feels more like a supercar that happens to have four doors. In all of the best and not so good ways. The space is at a premium <laughs> inside most cars of this size. In the case of the Aston, you certainly can't sprawl out in the interior unless you're quite a skinny small person. In the case of the Panamera, well, in fact, just to touch on the Aston Martin again for a moment, the other downside is the fuel economy. By far the worst of the three. Worse than a Bentley, in fact, because it's such a big, naturally aspirated, many-cylinder engine that, of course, it's going to be bad. Chances are you're not going to care too much, but real-world conditions, you're probably looking at something like 13, 14 to the gallon in practice. Moving on to the Porsche, though, the downsides really are, honestly, just the looks. For everything else, it is honestly that good of a car. And it's why I said earlier on, I believe people just don't give it enough of a chance. The Panamera is such an astonishingly good car that, of course I want to own one. It's a brilliant car. In first generation form, second generation sedan or wagon, it's just brilliant. It has by far, not even a competition, the best luggage space of the three. The interior is actually so perfectly designed, in my opinion, in terms of striking that balance between having enough space to feel like it's not claustrophobic, but simultaneously having the wide squat stance of a supercar. The Panamera does that so beautifully, and I think not enough people talk about that. It actually strikes a much better line than the Panamera does, or than the Rapide does, even. The Maserati, to go back to that for a second, well, actually, much to its credit, the Quattroporte has by far the best interior design in terms of just being a practical daily driver. It's a five-seater as standard. No fancy, weirdly shaped rear bucket seats, no huge center console like the Aston Martin. It has a proper full-size rear seat with excellent headroom due to the fact that the Quattroporte is shaped like a wedge or a chisel kind of shape, but also because it's Italian. So that back seat is going to get plenty of use, and they plan to have the back seat designed for Amore. And you can tell, it's practical because of that, much like my Lincoln is with the bench in the front and the back. Also though, even though the Maserati is the only car of the three to have a notch back boot, in other words it's not a hatch, the boot is a separate compartment on the back, it actually has a really good amount of boot space I would say for a car of its type. For a car that is that exotic, you could argue it could get away with not having great trunk space and people would still like it, much like the Aston. They went above and beyond in terms of how much space it actually has though, and for most scenarios, it's more than good enough. And if the boot isn't quite good enough, you could even use the back seats, the rear footwell, as long as you don't have five passengers. The Quattroporte I never found lacking for space. It's actually easily the best of the three in that regard. For interior space at least, for boot space the Panamera does take the edge. I will say as well that in real world conditions, especially using them as daily drivers if you are planning to, the Panamera just runs away with it there. That's where the other two simply cannot compete. My Quattroporte could average about 22 to the gallon in both cases, which isn't too bad. We already mentioned that the Aston is simply horrendous. The Porsche, though, I mean, it depends on the model. You get yourself a diesel, well, of course, the fuel economy is fantastic. But even if you go for a GTS or a Turbo or even a Turbo S with ridiculous power, about 520 or so, and even more torque, eclipsing the other two in terms of torque, in fact, you can average up around the 25 to the gallon region if you drive a Panamera carefully. And that's even a turbo. 
a 500 horsepower, nearly 200 mile an hour car. That's very impressive. Now, of course, in practice, it'll probably be lower than that for most people. But I do find that I'm pretty good for getting good fuel economy out of my cars, or at least good for what they are. So I think I could probably get 24, 25 out of it. In real world conditions, you should probably expect more like 20-ish. But given the advance in performance and power over the other two, I would say it's a pretty good trade-off. For day-to-day driving, in my opinion, it's an open and shut case. Panamera destroys the other two as a daily driver. They don't even stand a chance. In terms of driver enjoyment from a performance perspective, in other words, something that you want to take out just to have fun, something which looks good, sounds good, feels good, is fantastic through corners, and you don't even care whether or not it's the quickest around a track, you should 100% buy the Quattroporte. It has, to this day, one of, if not the, most beautifully set up handling signatures of any car I've ever driven. And one of the reasons why is the weight distribution. The Quattroporte is a highly unusual car. It has more weight over the back axle than the front, and the engine is very far back, giving it about as close to being a mid-engine sports car vibe as a, what, 16, 17 foot long two-ton limo could possibly have. The front wheels are towed out as well, so the turn-in is so responsive and so sharp that some people have even criticised the car for being twitchy. I'm the first person to criticise a car for being twitchy because I really don't like that. I adore the Quattroporte's handling. I, as I said, believe it's perfect and belies its weight. In fact, more so than either of the other two, the weight just melts away when you drive a Quattroporte at speed. You immediately forget just how big and heavy the car is, whereas with the Aston, as beautiful and as fast as it is, It feels every bit as big and as heavy as it is. It feels very similar to a Bentley, in fact, in that regard, but without the all-wheel drive advantage, unfortunately. In terms of the Porsche, well, much like a Nissan GTR, the Porsche is just crushingly capable. There's no other way of really putting it. As far as I'm concerned, the all-wheel drive is such a godsend in British weather. It means you can honestly use the car all year round without even giving it a second thought, but also the way that it delivers its performance, especially in turbo or turbo S form, because they have so much torque, it means that the engine never feels like it's even breaking a sweat. With the Aston, it's a torquey engine, but it's also quite a high revving V12, so it likes to be worked. The Aston, or the Maserati I should say, even more so. It's a screamer of an engine, up around 7,500, 8,000 RPM. It shares DNA with the Ferrari family for its engine technology. Well, of course it loves to be worked. In fact, one of my criticisms of the Quattroporte has been that the engine doesn't quite feel suited to the car. You would really want a torquey engine for a big limo, but when you drive it at speed, that's when the engine makes sense. And that brings me to possibly the biggest downside of the Maserati, because even though I touched on the reliability, which of course everyone already knows, and you need to budget for that, I would actually say that the biggest downside to the Maserati is that it's not a very good luxury car, (laughs) which is kind of a disappointing thing to say, but it's kind of a fact. Even those who, like myself, were fellow owners, if you really stop for a second, put your fandom to one side, if I can do that, you should be able to as well, it is my favourite brand after all, Really think, is my Quattroporte as comfortable as a Bentley? Well, I've owned both. I can tell you, no. (laughs) Objectively, no. It is not as comfortable as a Bentley. It's not even as comfortable as like a Mercedes AMG, let alone a Bentley. So for that, for ride quality, it is not as good of a luxury car. The space is fantastic, the seats are very nice, but the ride is so much more focused on performance and driver fun than it is being an actual limo. So I would say that is the biggest caution to buying a Quattroporte, and you'll feel whether or not you like that very quickly if you actually test drive one. I believe the most universal car of the three in terms of just impressing someone would probably be the Aston, because as soon as you sit in it, you feel like the boss of something. You feel like you own the road you're on. It just has tremendous road presence. But, being an Aston, everything's going to be expensive. Servicing, repairs, not only expensive, but specialist. You know, it's probably going to be an appointment-only kind of car. And even though that can apply to a Porsche and a Maserati as well, you should definitely expect that from an Aston, much like a Bentley. So ultimately, I think that pretty much wraps up my thoughts on the three. In terms of just sheer performance and staggeringly good engineering, 
the Porsche, in my opinion, is the clear winner. And even in terms of performance, as I alluded to, in a straight line at the very least, it wipes the floor with both of the other cars. I mean, it's not even close, and the all-wheel drive really does make a massive difference. The two biggest arrows that the Panamera has in its quiver, the two sharpest arrows, are all-wheel drive and massive torque. Those are such big advantages in terms of performance. The biggest arrows and the sharpest arrows in the Maserati's quiver are the sheer driver involvement, coupled with its charisma, etc., and a really, really good amount of interior space and practicality on a daily level in terms of just that. The space, the seats, the boot. The Aston Martin's biggest advantages are the way it makes you feel, just the sheer road presence. And when I say the way it makes you feel, I don't necessarily mean driver enjoyment, I mean prestige enjoyment. Like, it's a good car to show off in. Everyone will be looking at it, everyone will be impressed by it. So if that's the most important thing to you, then go for the Aston. For me, my ultimate thoughts, personally, putting everyone else to one side, are I've already had the Maserati. I don't think I would buy a third one. If I were to get another Maserati, it would probably be something like a Gran Turismo, just to change it up a bit. But I don't regret owning mine, and I really enjoyed them. My thoughts on the Porsche are I would love to have one. Originally, I wanted a Turbo, because it was kind of the best all round. But actually, I've kind of come around to wanting maybe a GTS more, because of the driver fun factor. And the Rapide is the car that I would like in the longer term. Because the Rapide, in many ways, is not the best of the three. The worst of the three. Trunk space, fuel, as mentioned. but it's just badass. <laughs> the Rapide is just such a stunningly impressive car. So of course I love to drive a car that everyone loves to see. I mean, I drive a 68 Lincoln. It's nearly 20 feet long and it's extremely loud, but everyone loves it. Much like a Rapide, it is a car which brings a lot of people joy. And I think that does appeal to me on that level. If you have already maybe owned one, maybe you've driven one or more of these, or even if you're just a fan from a, a distance, give me your thoughts. Which one do you like, dislike? Have I maybe encouraged you to consider something new that you might not have realised or considered before? I certainly hope so. And I will say, I really hope so in, in the case of the Panamera in particular, because the car doesn't deserve to get the insults that it does. It's a tremendous machine. Ultimately, though, that's it for my thoughts. Of course, I will see you guys next time. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.